a random encounter at a broadcasting facility, a shared interest and love of all things Marvel, Excelsior, a misinterpreted program title, and behold, a podcast is born. Peter Melnick, podcaster and comic book enthusiast, and Eddie Wilson, upstate New York radio announcer, still with an inordinate amount of catching up to do. Peter! What are you doing? Here we go with a new episode of The Marvelists. This is Al Ewing, currently working on the Immortal Hulk, Guardians of the Galaxy, a sword. We only find them when they're dead. A Defenders, Gamma Flight, and probably a couple of other things besides. And you're listening to The Marvelists with Peter Melnick and Eddie Wilson. Welcome, everyone, to The Marvelists, the Marvel, Marvel Universe, Universe podcast. podcast. I'm Peter Melnick. And I'm Eddie Wilson. And before we get into the usual rigmarole of today's topic at hand and introducing our special guest, we want to tell you all at home how you can get a hold of us on them, our social medias. Go ahead. First off, go on Facebook at facebook.com slash The Marvelists. Find us on Twitter, Instagram at the Marvelists. You can also find us individually on social media. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Peter Melnick. And there's only one place in the whole worldwide interweb to find Eddie Wilson, and that is on Instagram at Eddie9193. You can also find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash The Marvelists. Help support the show for as little as $3 a month to as much as <laughs> exactly whatever your little heart desires. You can also, as a, you know, you can also be able to listen to our deep dive of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby's iconic, legendary, and fantastic even. Well, run, run, run. Run on the Fantastic Four featuring all 102 issues. Well, when we get to them, we will. One we'll, at a time. We just recorded number 12 today yes. with our guest on this episode. But we also cover crossovers. We cover so much. Even what ifs even. Oh, yes. We can you also get for $8 a month plus the ability to guest host this here fine program. Possibility, at least. You can also support the show on belowthecollar.com slash The Marvelists. And God willing, if you've made it this far, you are Dad Joke Immune. Thank you. You can be able to buy the Dad Joke Immune t-shirt, which features my favorite review of all time, just absolutely bashing us, yet still giving us a five-star review. Because, well, any press is good press. What's up with that? Exactly, Hurricane Holmes. Thank Thank you. you. But also listen to the show on a wide variety of streaming platforms. Tune in radio, Stitcher Radio, Podbean, SoundCloud, Spotify, you name it. Yamo be there because that joke is never not funny. (laughs) Car crash noises. Anyway. Only always unhumorous now at this mm-hmm. point. I don't know. iTunes, rate, review, subscribe. Ever so kindly five stars if you feel like it. And yeah. Eddie. Let's go with I'll be there for you, Rembrandt's, next time. How about that? Yeah, but I hate that show. That's Friends, right? I, I hate that show. Yeah, that well, show it's a nice song, though. No, I don't care. The show stinks on ice. Oh, man. But Eddie. Peter. Join, joining us on the virtual tin cannon string. Yes, from across the big pond. We are joined with the writer of The Immortal Hulk, the writer of formerly of Valkyrie, of Sword currently, of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Many others. Among Yes, many others, including titles over at Boom Comics. Ladies and gentlemen, returning to the show for the one, two, three, four, technically five now with, you know, the Fantastic Voyage. Number five time, Al Ewing. Al, welcome thank back. You, thank you for putting up with this long meandering intro. <laughs> Hello. No, uh, my pleasure. Um, how are you guys? All good? Do as it. good as can be, yes. Mm. Better so, now that we're with you, or something like that. Al, <laughs> Immortal Hulk is ending, and as I had yeah. said last year when you were on the program, in our two-part episode, I was heartbroken to learn about that. And, well, things happened in the world where it kind of postponed it, so got a little bit of a reprieve on the Hulk, Immortal Hulk's immortality. So that was nice, in a way, but not really. You know what I mean. You, you get yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, you know, te- <laughs> technically speaking, but uh, we're, we're ending on the number we were always going to end on. So, um, you know, it's uh, it was just that there was a time when the comic wasn't arriving in shops. Isn't it interesting that it took a year for this series to essentially end? Uh, it's... I mean, it's basically the kind of, um, again, because of the COVID thing, uh, we were previously on a very regular 
schedule of um, and I think we we had a, a slight blip around the 25 mark but um, aside from that it was basically three issues every two months um, and then basically because of, of COVID and the kind of you know there was the hiatus and then after that it's been one issue per month um, I think across the board with like a, most comics um, and I think that's basically a result of you know it might be um, just just re, rethinking re, uh, rethinking things post the hiatus um, in terms of you know what what the optimum number of uh, of comics on the shelf is, I mean I'm you know I'm not in the room for for discussions on that, but I'd imagine that's what it was. And with the the title of the Immortal Hulk, with it ending in the very near future, because as of this recording, we're getting issue number forty seven hitting the stands as of this recording on June first, twenty twenty one. One of the things about this title that is showing the impact of the title of the Immortal Hulk. There's oh so many one-shots by both yourself as well as other writers. And when you first pitched this story, the idea of bringing the Hulk back, the Hulk back from the dead, did you expect this title to get the impact that it did? I absolutely did not. It was um, what I was what I was hoping for was to um, to have a Hulk comic that was you know, well received and, um, you know, did its job in, in being a decent Hulk comic. Uh, the, the reception that it's had over the years has been pretty, pretty mind blowing, quite honestly. Um, so yeah, it was, it was far beyond what I expected. Um, I think the fact that we're reaching issue 50, and stopping because we choose to. Um, that's that's saying something in this day and age. Uh, it's um, you know a, a Hulk book. Uh, I was thinking, I was thinking I'd have like about about eighteen issues to tell my story, eighteen to twenty. You know, a decent number perfectly reasonable good number um and you know the the you know they're, they're kind of the way things are um with with comics sometimes with uh with new series even with these big established characters you're sort of telling you know a volume uh, a season, and and then you know it's your time to uh, to hand it over. So to be actually to actually be able to tell like not just the story I wanted to tell, but a kind of extended and because basically very soon after um, I'd say it was around issue seven, we knew we had a lot of time. By issue fifteen or sixteen, we knew we had like all the time in the world, um, and we began planning accordingly. Uh, so things like issue twenty-five, uh, you know, I knew what that was going to be quite early on. Um, you know, it was like, okay, well, I can do this, and then issue fifty. We could pitch that, and I won't. I won't drop any spoilers of the shape that'll take and the form that'll take, and uh, some of some of the things we have planned for it. But um, it's in the same way that twenty five was like a big, a big issue, a big ambitious uh, project. Uh, Fifty is, you know, more so. So we we've been able to we've been able to achieve kind of all of them. And I think we even uh, we even had gotten um since we spoke to you last which is around the time of issue 25 coming out that you knew at that point 
where or how far you would be able to go with it. And 50 seemed to be the number yep. that it would be uh, landing landing at. Um, you also mentioned with the uh, s- solicitations in regards to the Marvel previews, where like once you start reading certain parts of it, certain keywords, you'll realize, oh, it's ending. I mean, the, I think the last we haven't we haven't quite done what I said I'd do, which is um, I said that you'd only know it was ending when the last station came up, and the fact that it just became so obvious that we were winding it up that like um, I just started telling people, you know, we all started telling people early. Um, but yeah, the last the last solicitation that's come out is I think forty nine, which is it's one of the heaviest. It's it's pretty much paraphrasing Dante. Um, issue issue fifty. I don't even know how I'm going to describe it. I don't even. I you know I feel like the solicitation is just going to be like it's issue fifty of Immortal Hulk. It's the last issue of Immortal Hulk. You know. Square bound. Let's describe it as square bound. I mean, it, it might well be. <laughs> but, um, yeah, basically, um, we're kind of at the stage where it's, uh, you know, I feel like for that last issue, there's there's no description of, of what's in it that would make people more likely to buy it. Um and you know, I'll do I'll do my best. I'll we'll all I've always tried to um to write good solicit copy and you know this this one will be no exception, but it's yeah, it's it's gonna be a biggie. It's gonna be huge. And um, you know, borderline rewinding to the beginning of the title, you know, this question comes from Todd Mathy on Twitter. The idea of, you know, how did you design your pitch for when you originally proposed the, the uh, Immortal Hulk? And how did you condense such a rich series into essentially a one-page document? Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a one-page document. It was more like five, I, th- I want to say it was like five or six pages, maybe even eight pages. But it was, um, I talked a lot about tone. Um, I talked about how important the tone would be. Uh so that was that was a big thing, like really getting across the kind of horror I wanted to make it, and the sort of um, you know ideas of how this would be different from hog series that had come before in that in that tunnel space. And in terms of the actual plot of the book, um, I pitched basically till issue thirteen. Um, in that, I and and even then, just kind of most of it. Um, in that, I sort of I pitched a version of the book that would be like, and even in that, I was sort of going. And if it ends after five issues, then we can stop it here, you know. But here's where it'll be. Um, you know, here's a version of it that will be sort of, and then we'll move on to there to sort of deal with the repercussions of that, and that'll take us to like eighteen issues if it has to. And it's sort of, it was it was very much this thing of like, I'm going to pitch like a year and a half, a year to a year and a half on this book, and and we'll go from there, but. It was it was very much sort of a, a kind of a playing it quite safe in terms of the um, in terms of the length and trying to sort of go for it a bit on the in terms of the tone and the content and the sort of um, things. Some some pieces of it kind of started falling into place once the thing was up and rolling. Uh, like I'm pretty sure the um, the one below all came in I think in the pitch that was something else and yeah I think while I was writing issue one or possibly issue two it occurred to me that like because I knew um 
the thing I wanted to use, I think, was, and I'll probably, once everything's finished, I'll probably, like, you know, give a lot more of the inside baseball in this. But the thing I wanted to use was, I think, in New South Wales. And I was like, okay, well, let's let's think of a new thing. And that was when, because having just dealt with the one above all in Ultimates, the one below all, um, you know, it, it had this appeal. It was like, oh, yeah, let's do that. And, and that was very early on because we started dropping hints about the one below all. Um, I think it was as... Um, it, it was as early as issue two. Um, so, because we already had the green door stuff in place. Um, but I think, yeah, it was, it would have been that early that we, that the one below all was locked in, but it wasn't in the pitch. It was, uh, I'm pretty sure that was something, something else, a different malevolent entity. So, you know, it's things like that. It, it's, it's evolved. It's evolved over time. And it's very interesting with what you're doing now with this title of the Immortal Hulk because you're also working concurrently on multiple other titles. You're working on mm. Sword. You're working on uh, Guardians of the Galaxy as well as we, fi- uh, we only find them when they're dead. Yeah. For Boom. Um. And again, just, you know, being able to catalog... All of your thoughts, I would imagine, is a uh, unique kind of thing with making sure all the plot lines of everything match each other. And, you know, you don't, you know, you know what I mean? You like juggling everything. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's pretty difficult. The um, certain things are, again, COVID kind of um, meant that. Certain things like um, I, I believe the Defender series was just announced. Um, that that would have fallen a little earlier. Um, so you know, there's there's an element of sort of juggling quite a lot, quite a lot falling at once. Um, but it's you know, I'm, I'm managing to make it work so far, and what's coming out the other end seems you know. Now you mentioned. Too- Oh, go ahead. Pretty good. So, no, I was just going to finish that thought. Uh, you mentioned the defenders. With this upcoming series from yourself, who will your team be? Has it been announced yet? Um, it it hasn't been. I well, it's sort of the cover. It's been on the cover. There's um, if you look at the uh, the cover that Javier did, uh, you you see um. Doctor Strange, uh, Cloud, the Mass Raider, uh, Red Harpy, and Silver Nor- Surfer. Yep. And um, uh, he did a he did a cover previous to that, which was had a lot of the defenders, and that that got an announcement like quite a while back. Um, but that had like tarot cards with like a lot of potential defenders on. And I think we are now sort of narrowing it down a bit in terms of uh, reader expectations of like who, who the defenders will be at least to begin with. And um, yeah, I was I basically just picked picked those five as kind of like a really good spread of previous defenders that would do everything I needed the team to do, and also cover cover all the bases of like um, you know the. Defenders past, present, and you know, and uh, and and the various abilities and personalities I I needed to be on the team. Over the past uh, few years, the Defenders lineup has vastly changed, both in terms of the overall lineup as well as the overall vibe of who they are. You know, with the Netflix series from a few years ago, it was more grounded as a street-level team, you know, especially incorporating the Brian Michael Bendis run with the Heroes for Hire, Daredevil, Jessica Jones, etc. And it's very interesting to see that for some fans, they know them only as a street-level team, but there's oh so much more to what the Defenders are. I mean, I I think 
you know, the Defenders could be that team again. Um, they could be that sort of street level concept again. It's and certainly there's a whole bunch of people. Anyone who's sort of started with the TV shows and those people are going to exist. People who have started, you know, their Marvel experience with uh, the Netflix shows, um, yeah, they're going to be they're going to be freaked out by this um, this this non team of sort of oddballs and widows, uh, and it's kind of I feel like with with the defenders, you know. It can be. It can be both things. Uh, the Defenders' tent is big enough to encompass an entirely street-level team of sort of, you know, the, the TV guys, and also be this sort of very Dot Strange-related kind of quite eclectic team of, uh, of you know, the Stranger heroes. Um and it could be all of those things. And that's what I've always loved about the original version of the Defenders, where we have these, you know, as you say, weirdos, and the element of like characters like Doctor Strange acting alongside a Silver Surfer or the uh, ever angry Green Hued Hulk. You know, you have all these characters that they're their own thing. They they would not fit in one specific mold they're so out there they can do whatever they want to do I mean the way the way I see it is um, if the Avengers are, are the culture the Defenders is the counterculture, culture um, and they're kind of almost their role in the scheme of things um, that's like the, the thing where like all of the teams are you know, model on some sort of grouping. You know, the, the Fantastic Four as a family, the the X Men was a school, I guess. Now is a country. Um, the uh, the Avengers are a kind of a club. The Defenders are a commune, um, and it's. I think I think they should always have that kind of. Um, you know that that thing where they're not they're not the mightiest heroes. You know, even if even if they are power wise mightier, they shouldn't be the most famous, most A list kind of. They should be off the beaten track. They should be kind of strange. They shouldn't be a team in the traditional sense. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I've always liked non team as a as a descriptor. I've always thought that was like a really fun way of kind of referring to them now going back to the to the regular run of immortal hulk um and i like to do this because peter shakes his head is bring some of these one shots these side stories that i happen to collect for example uh, immortal hulk zero and the king in black one Hold shot on, let me shake my head there we go and the most recent one time of monsters which to me i was reading i said wait is yes. this a hulk book this is a total this is a different this is a different tangent you're, you're off on, and a couple of them seem like, I guess, no-brainers. Let's retell an origin story with Immortal Hulk Zero, and then, of course, the Immortal She-Hulk that would kind of be like, all right, well, it happened to her too? What? But but the question I'm getting at here is... Have you ever uh, been in a submarine? Stop it! That's your question, not my question. <sighs> Sorry, Al. My question is, at what point during the course of writing the regular run of Immortal Hulk did you come up with these other ideas and say, hey, what if we did just something on the side that wouldn't fit in the storyline and we don't have enough time to explore these other ideas? You know, did they come, come about? If you I recall? mean, it's... it's um, with Time of Monsters, that wasn't... <clears throat> that wasn't me who came up with the idea originally. That was uh, Alex. Alex Packenbrock. Um, who basically came to me and was like, are you guys still doing the one-shots? Because I've had this idea, you know. I like to kind of... But I like to explore these themes and I like to set it in the future. <coughs> and I was like, well, we've kind of got a future mapped out with the, uh, the whole... We've sort of got a timeline of the future. But what I'd love to see is like, have you thought about setting in the distant past? And he kind of went away and he came back with this thing that was just blew, blew me out of the water, which was like, um, not just the, 
the distant past, but like in the distant past. And um, yeah, you know, we kind of we we back and forth about it, and he sort of, you know, we we kind of credit it with like him first and me second, and that's that's true to like how much of the story was was it was, and he definitely like uh, the lion's share of it and like kind of just made a few suggestions here and there to kind of tie it in with the, the whole immortal thing um, but that is that is an example of the kind of one shot that like I love that we've been able to do something so completely different something so um, outside even the main book um, never mind you know the rest of the the Marvel U and it's just um Whereas with the the other tie-ins, the ones that are King and Black, they've they've all had uh, reasons to exist. Like, um, you know, they would they wanted to do a Hulk Zero issue uh, that reprinted a couple of stories, and that seemed like a really good idea to me because it meant I could get eyes on. Both the Bill Mantlo thing, um, that Bill Mantlo issue that gets very deep into Brian Banner, who's a very important character, yeah. and that's an issue. That's I think the one issue that people really need to read. Um, and then also the the Peter David minus one issue, which comes back to Brian Banner, but um, basically is very hard to find because it's a minus one. It doesn't, you know. The numbering of it doesn't fit with, uh, you know, any kind of logical thing. You know, does it come between two issues of Peter David and Adam Cubitt's Hulk run? Does it come, you know, before issue one? Um, it's like, yeah, it just seems to be really difficult to find for that reason. So reprinting that as Immortal Hulk Zero, again, a no-brainer. I could add, you know, a 10 page uh, framing sequence, which <laughs> the idea was, you know, readers could skip it because they get the information later. But if they, um, if they picked it up, that was the first indication that uh, Samuel Stearns had basically absorbed Brian Banner into himself. Um, and yeah, so that, that had a reason to guess the, uh, the, King and Black and Absolute Carnage tie-ins they were basically um, yeah I knew the Hulk was going to play a role in in Absolute Carnage and you know Donnie really wanted him to fight uh, a Venom Hulk to fight um, with Carnage and I was like okay well let me do let me do the tie-in on my end and we can you know we can we can say how Bruce got there and sort of uh you know, bringing up a few things and kind of get into it and sort of, yeah. And then that went so well that the, the King and Black time, um, and that became an opportunity to say, okay, let's do this wordless comic. Let's do this kind of, um, sort of this, this different thing that, and with the, the She-Hulk one again, that was like, She-Hulk's an empire. We knew, pretty much since the first story meeting that we were going to be using like the green door and the immortal Hulk stuff. So to have a tie in with the empire branding that basically sort of explain that, explain Jen's ties to it, um, gave us a kind of, I have to be quite careful of spoilers at this point, but like, yeah. You know, Jane, uh, Jen's sort of connections to the whole of Moral Hog story to get into that. Um, yeah, it's it's like they all the reason to exist comes first. It's not it's not me pitching the idea. It's me sort of going, okay, well, we want to do this. What can I do with that? Whereas the 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 one offs, the one shots, they kind of come from people like Declan. Um, who did that wonderful flatline thing that he wrote and drew? Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's there is a difference between the ones that sort of come in from outside, from people who are like 
very enjoying the book and really want to kind of get into these these sort of quarterly one shots and the ones that kind of exist because they have a need to exist and then we sort of build on that in terms of like okay so how can we make this thing that probably has to exist to fill in this little gap here and this piece of connected tissue how do we make that into an experience so it's not just you know a tie-in it's it's something and yeah i think i feel like I feel like we've um, everybody's everybody involved has, has done a good job with that. Now, over at Boom Studios, you're currently working on the title "We Only Find Them When They're Dead," and that just recently had the uh, first volume trade paperback collection get released. Tell the people at home what that series is about. Um, that series is uh, it's set a couple of hundred years in the future. Um, in a, a colony on the edge of galactic space, the furthest uh, humanity has managed to spread, uh, looking out into the gulfs uh, between galaxies and drifting out of these gulfs at regular intervals come the corpses of gigantic uh, space gods. For one. And the gods are then mined or autopsied uh, by fleets of autopsy ships for rare and delicious meats, uh, rare metals on the armor that they wear, and there are these sort of crystalline jewels in the center of the chest which uh, become very important. Um, And yeah, it's basically... The, the thrust of the first trade is uh, one of the captains of these autopsy ships uh, wants to go and find a live one. And the decision to do that, the, the sort of obsession we're doing that, the first trade is very much, you know, what prompted this, um, what, uh, you know, what he's, what he's really chasing, what he's really running from. What happens when he, you know, spoilers, when he does find a live one. Um, and we kind of, issue six just came out uh, very recently. So that's that's in stores now if you want to pick up, uh, if you like the trade and you want to pick up the sixth issue. I believe that's, that's hit the stands. Um, and what, what that is, is... Uh, yeah, basically, um, we kind of see what the decisions made in the events of the first trade uh, do 50 years down the line. Um, so it's we're kind of dealing with a very long, long-term story here, a very, a very kind of long game. Do you see the series maybe surpassing Immortal Hulk? I think they're doing two different things. Um, I, in terms of amount, uh, this it's going to be fifteen issues. It's going to be three books of five issues, and uh, the three those three trades together will sort of tell a, tell a story. At the end of which, we'll have um, a period of history for us worlds to kind of. And you know maybe maybe we can go back to that, uh, but the initial certainly the initial run is going to be fifteen inches. Um, so in terms of in terms of amount, the mobile hole is going to be longer. Uh, I think it's there's always that thing between um, create your own indie work and big two work involving the superheroes uh, in that. People are going to kind of hunt down the superhero work and sort of it'll it'll get a lot of press. It'll sort of um, a lot of people will talk about it. I think artistically, um, I'm 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 happy with where we only find them is going. I think um, 
we're going to end up telling something very special in that space. Um, but it is going to be, I, I, you know, I, I think surpassing is like, you're kind of asking me to, to make my babies fight in an arena. <laughs> So I won't say I won't say surpass, but I I think yeah you know, I think it'll equal it. I think it'll definitely when people put Immortal Hulk down, and when they put We Only Find Them When They're Dead down, having sort of read it all, um, I'd I'd like them to feel the same level of satisfaction for both, and to feel that they've had a similar quality experience for both. One of the things about We Only Find Them When They're Dead that really attracted me to the book, other than the fact that when I heard the announcement, Al Ewing is doing a book for Boom, well, day one uh, purchase. That was already, you know, instantaneously. Say no more. That's on my poll. But with this series that really attracted me to it is the covers. The covers are, like, absolutely eye-catching, and when you go to your local comic shop and you see that sitting on the new release wall or on the spinner rack, if they have those still, you see that and you're just like, wow, I want to check that out. They, yeah, they do look great. I, somebody has done such a wonderful job on those, just, like, over and over. And with the new, with the new book... Um, like six six to ten the the covers he's doing for that is kind of taking what one to five were doing and sort of spinning that a little bit so it's <coughs> but the um i i do take credit for the idea of having the title so big on the cover um that was that was something i sort of sent in as like oh yeah and the, we should do the title like this and it's just this gigantic thing it's eye catching. You know, like slant well that was the idea i wanted something that would just stand out against all other all other comics on the shelf um but the what simone has done with that brief is just you know goes beyond and in like i say in issue six um if you see the title for that yeah he's taking that original brief and just doing his own thing with it and it's uh, it's absolutely wonderful what he's doing and I, you know, I can't wait to see what he does with um, with issue eleven. You know, the start of book three, and because that's going to be that's going to be changing things up again. And before we wrap this episode up, because we also realize, look what time it is over by you. We <laughs> we, we know. <laughs> yeah, so. it is. It is after midnight. But uh, you know, I'm happy happy to keep that. But before we go, one of the things that, you know, we had talked about on one of your first times on the program was the fact that when you got onto Immortal Hulk, you were given the cover artist of the great Alex Ross. And issue after issue, Alex knocks it out of the park, much like you do with your writing in the series and everyone involved creatively, artistically on the book. When you found out that you were getting Alex Ross to do covers for you, was there a possibility that you thought to yourself, maybe, am I going to get my own personal Alex Ross uh, cover to sit in my own home? Um, I, I, don't, I don't think I could. Uh, I don't think I, no, I, 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 those covers are so good. I could not, like, um, that would be like, you know. I, I I could not take that away from uh, from from somebody else or from or you know take that sale away from him, but like um, those those no, those cups are just so amazing, and having him on the book, um, I think that did that did give it a that big sales boost uh, early on, um, and just to have the opportunity to just have him do all of these amazing covers just one after the other I feel like it's taken sort of it took about 50 issues to kind of like get fully on his wavelength um but like there's been so many so many good covers of that run um I think my absolute favourites out of a crowded field are the ones that are riffing off famous paintings Right. 
because uh, there's a few of that where the prompts because um, the, the, the cover is the first thing um, the prompt for the cover is like the first kind of the bit where the the issue crosses from you know uh, some ideas on the Hulk map for like okay and in this issue we're going to do this and it's like you know a little a few a couple of sentences like paragraph at most um from like some document that I've been tinkering solidly with you know but it's but that's that's a that's a document I can change at any time if I had a sudden brainwave I could like warp it out and shove a lot of stuff in um but when I gave um I was going to say GIF, but it's gave now. When I gave Alex the cover prompts, that was the first locking in of that issue. And what that issue would be. Because, you know, the cover has to relate to what's inside. You know, we're, we're not in the business of... Uh, back in the back in the, the noughties, those covers that were basically just pinups. Um... You know, Immortal Hog's not in the business of doing that. We we like covers that have something to do with what's inside. Um, but it's, yeah, that would lock it in. And then, you know, so I had to know what would be in the, uh, roughly what would be in the, uh, in the book. Right. And a lot of the time, uh, I'd be kind of like, oh, there's a there's a classical painter that would that sums us up, and oh, I'd love to see I'd love to see Alex's take on this, and then that started in the hell arc, where it was like, okay, well, we want this art to be we want this art to be different, so instead of cover prompts, which would you know the cover prompt before it'd be like, okay, uh, a massive green door in the desert, and folks staring up at it, and you know, that's, I'm pretty sure that's all it was. And that ended up, you know, beautiful cover. And then 11, I think I sent him truth coming out of her world to shame mankind. And basically, you know, said, yeah, look, these three issues are going to be sent in hell. Um, so 11, you know, a whole kind of emerging and into the landscape of hell and similar to the, and and just the way he riffed on that that might be one of my favorite covers of the whole run the way he riffed on that because he sort of took that prompt and turned it into something completely different you know nobody else could have done it uh i could never have seen it coming it completely transformed the brief uh this is this is what alex ross does he's um you know one of the the great talents, to put it to put it mildly, one of the great talents of our time. Uh, and Al, I got to say that um, maybe we talked about it the first time around when we had you. We were getting close to Immortal Hulk number twenty five, but I got into the Immortal Hulk late at Peter's prompting, uh, partially because he said, Eddie. We're getting Al Ewing. You better get caught up on this title. And it's really hot, and it's horror, and you like Halloween and horror. So like, so I did. I was able to get caught up uh, starting with, I don't know, I think it was about 18 issues were out already. But I was able to get it all together. I'm up on top of it. And, you know, I, of course, it's ending. and But just an incredible, yes, run. And looking forward to, you know, what's next, especially with... Rampaging respect to uh, Gamma Flight, yeah, that's coming up and getting to explore these characters a little bit more, even well, if it's a mini series. Let me let me talk about Gamma Flight quickly because um, I'm I'm having a great time on that. I'm uh, I'm working with uh, Crystal, who uh, helped out to a very great deal when um, we wrote the the issues with uh, Shelley McGowan, uh, where she. Uh, let let the readers know she was trans and um, yeah working with her it's we kind of 50-50 split it uh, but her handle on all these characters is just kind of perfect and it's um, it's such a fun book to write it's such the art's beautiful as well it's uh, 
it's it's La Medina. It's like just gorgeous. Um, but yeah, we get to we get to kind of get into these characters in a way that I didn't think I'd have room to do. Um, but we get we really get to kind of follow them and sort of you know bud off this tree a little bit um, and kind of split off into yeah something that's I think is going to be if you like the Immortal Hulk I think you should pick it up if you have a hankering for you know a more traditional gamma adventure I think you'll like it as well I think it's I think it's that rare thing that plays to the entire theatre um, and it's absolutely it's been it's been loads of fun when I really needed some fun so yeah I really I really hope everybody listening to this picks Gamma Flight up I think um, I think they'll they'll have a really good time if they do I'm looking forward to when we get more more normal more safer that we get to see you in 2022 at a show someplace that would be awesome but yeah, I mean, I've, I've got to admit that like, uh, it's probably good that Immortal Hulk is coming to an end now because, you know, do people really want a monthly dose of pain and horror <laughs> in their long box? Um, it's an escape. Is it time to... Yeah, I, I feel I feel one thing you can say about Gamma Flight is that it's, it's a little more lighthearted and a little more of an escape and... You know, it'll be a really nice after you've been dragged through hell, quite literally, by Mother Hulk. You can pick up your issue of Gamma Flight. And oh, like, over and over. And when you have a yeah. Samson Sasquatch combo and a character like Puck, it's got to be somewhat lighthearted. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a little it's a little bit it's a little bit brighter, um, which I think is good. I think well, that's what everybody needed. I'll get mine in now. Thank you for that immortal run and then the stuff that you've done and and looking forward again to the future with you uh, thanks for reading and thank you for having me on the show absolutely and before we go al as you know we you had said in your uh fantastic voyage appearance (laughs) we really can't find you much on social media but we can go to aluing.tumblr.com yeah that is that is the place to find my read through of Incredible Hulk and all my thoughts on it. Um, I get pretty far into it. I get to like the uh, the appearance of Wolverine. I get to uh, Adam Warlock. Um, I get a, I, you know, I take a, I take a decent swing at a at a complete read through. Um, and I think yeah, people people will probably enjoy enjoy going through that. Think- um, in terms of actually getting in contact with me, I've. I've gone full recluse. It had to happen. Um, so you probably can't at this point, but you know. Carrier pigeon? Uh, yeah, carrier pigeon. That's how. That'll do it. Ferry cross the Mersey. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's an old back. That's an old throwback. Um, yeah. No, actually, if you get to issue two hundred, I think that was a Hulk versus Banner kind of thing. That would be cool to find your take on on that. At that point, well, do you know what? Maybe, then, maybe once, maybe when I've finished writing issue fifty, and I've got a little gap between finishing writing it and it coming out, I'll uh, I'll finish up the read through up to um, up to two hundred, and if I haven't got there already, I've been ages since I looked at it. Yeah, but um, you know, I'll, yeah, I'll finish up the read through and kind of um, I'll I'll have my last little sound out there, and then and then that'll be it. I can wander away. I mean, personally, if I were you, I would go the smaller kind of run to, you know, try and tackle. Maybe, like, you know, the uh, Dan Slott, Ren and Stimpy comics, you know, maybe do, a, like, a read-through yeah. of those. Those are pretty good. It's, yeah, I mean, I, um, that is something I've been wanting to check out, actually. The kind of... Happy, happy, joy, joy. I enjoy the yeah, fact that Dan Slott Stimpy. first wrote Spider-Man in a uh, Ren and Stimpy comic. That is my favorite fun fact. <laughs> it is fun and I mean... fact. I mean, I, I first wrote Hulk in a um, a UK only uh, one of those one of those comics they have over here with like toys on the front. Um, I'm trying to remember. What, I think it was just called Marvel Heroes, but it was it was an original, you know, UK only. That UK only continuity. Um, there was there was a period where like 
Spider-Man had reprints and also had like some original stories. Um, and it's very much in that continuity. And it's a Hulk story with uh, with John McRae. And uh, he fights Craven the Hunter. And I, I don't know how you could possibly get hold of that, but that is my very first Hulk story. So, yeah, collectors. That's <laughs> that's your new golden ticket right there. Yeah. Go, go hunt it now. Oh, great stuff. Al, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you for your time, as always. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Stay well. I'm looking forward to more. And, to, and again, seeing you out next year. Yep. Yep. I will be probably probably venturing out into America in 2022. All right. For The Marvelists, I'm Peter Melnick. Uh, I'm Al Ewing. And I'm Eddie Wilson. Excelsior! <laughs> <laughs>